before, but uh, so many great companies, um, many of which are based here in Seattle, but a lot of which aren't. Um, and excited that everyone has carved out some time, so thank you so much for your time. Uh, raise your hand if you met someone new tonight. Awesome, that's the goal. Uh, you know, exchange phone numbers, share emails, uh, send best practices, that's, that's the goal here. Um, we've got a really great night with three speakers tonight, um, starting with David Lewis, who comes from Starbucks, Principal Cloud Engineer. So I'll let David get going, and then uh, I've got some, some uh, house things uh, to cover later on tonight. But we've got three speakers, uh, two sponsors speaking, and then more happy hour. Uh, if anyone wants a drink after, we've got Collins Pub down, down the road. So have a great night. Thank you. Let me know if I'm um, talking too quietly and you can't hear me in the back and I'll, I'll try to speak even louder. Okay. Hey. <laughs> you needed a microphone for this. Uh, hey, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, this is great, great really to be kind of back in our community of Kubernetes experts. We've got a few more years of experience since we saw each other last, which is awesome and terrible at the same time. So I, I uh, presented Phil with a couple of topics to talk about, and he picked the most provocative title he possibly could have. I mean, I came up with the title, but he was like, yeah, we want that one at a Kubernetes meetup. Like, that totally makes sense. So um, if you can't see it in the back, it says, stop caring about Kubernetes. No, not you guys, probably not most of you, but well, probably some of you. So um, this is, uh, is going to be a, a little bit, uh, this might challenge you a little bit on, on what we're doing and see if it really makes sense, you know? Really kind of open your mind up. So a little bit about me, I am a principal cloud engineer at Starbucks Technology. Um, basically everything that flows through the cloud goes through my team. Um, I've been an IT professional for about 20 years and uh, in my spare time I do long distance horseback riding. And uh, code and horseback riding have absolutely nothing in common whatsoever. So it made the most sense for me to do that hobby. Um, I did, the longest distance I've gone is 87 miles in, uh, in about 17 hours. So um, long distance, very different from coding. Um, all right, so first I wanted to cover kind of the state of Kubernetes. This is slightly outdated information because this is from a 2021 uh, CNCF survey. CNCF is a com com uh, it's the Cloud Native uh, computing. computing Foundation, right? So it's the foundation that does Kubernetes and all of the ecosystem of technology and open source technology that's around Kubernetes. And from the 2021 survey, 96% of the respondents were evaluating Kubernetes for usage. 69%, I noticed how they flip those, those two numbers are, are flipped there. Uh, use Kubernetes currently in production, so obviously that number is higher now, being that we're in 2023. Uh, last I checked, there was 113,000 commits to the core Kubernetes GitHub repository and doesn't <coughs> count all the hundreds of Kubernetes related software and repositories that are out there. Um, so it has turned into this really big behemoth, right? Um, I mean, we're practically rivaling the Linux operating system at this point. 85% of IT leaders agree that Kubernetes is at least extremely important, somewhat important, or importance, right? So it's a really big deal. I mean, you, if we're in this field, you gotta kinda know about Kubernetes. But do you, right? 72% uh, of respondents expected to increase container usage over the next year, right, from where we currently are. So the adoption is, is we st still see a very high curve of adoption, basically is what that means. 55% expect Kubernetes to reduce their infrastructure cost by 20% over the year. That uh, is pretty cool. I mean, that's a, that's a benefit of Kubernetes, but I want to talk about what other hidden costs Kubernetes has that we don't automatically think about. And of course, a really big one that's kind of a part of that. 94% of the survey respondents said that they encountered security incidents that are related directly to Kubernetes and or containers. So that's a pretty high number. That means that you know, going into containers does not solve your security problem. It just creates lots of, lots of different kinds. So this is kind of a typical sales page for Kubernetes. And I'm not here to sell Kubernetes to any of you. That's not the purpose of my talk, but I want to address some of, some of the key reasons that companies and IT departments like to promote Kubernetes as something that, that we want to do. And it's because of this incredible uh, orchestration system 
that Kubernetes is and the ability for it to, um, to, to give our apps the ability for, for high availability, for scaling out, for running on lots of nodes, this, the whole orchestration thing, you know, how it can manage secrets and storage and all these other things that are kind of part of this Kubernetes ecosystem and which is that's just kind of the core functionality of Kubernetes that doesn't even take into account all this this bigger ecosystem that's around that's part of the CNCF that's part of uh, Kubernetes itself and of course one one thing people love about Kubernetes YAML right it's for ordinary humans it's like this language <laughs> ordinary humans. Um, and we're all ordinary humans here right uh, but Kubernetes is like regex in some way. You know, you've heard the joke, you're like, uh, if you want to solve a problem, use regex, and now you have two problems. <laughs> Kubernetes is kind of like that too. Now you have two problems, but Kubernetes probably gives you about a, a hundred more problems, not two. Um, and this list could be longer, but I'm not here to solve Kubernetes. So Kubernetes got very popular very quickly, and why was that? Because um, uh, you might not be able to read this. these slides, this is Dilbert cartoon. I need to know why moving our app to the cloud didn't automatically solve all of our problems. And Dilbert says, well, you wouldn't let me architect the app to be cloud native. And he says, well, just put it in containers. You can't solve a problem just by saying techie things. And he says, Kubernetes. <laughs> because of course that's gonna solve the problem. It's kind of like saying, oh, NFT is like the next big thing, so let's do that. Or blockchain, like that sounds cool. And we have no freaking idea what it is or what it does. Uh, Kubernetes is really fun, solves lots of problems, and it's shiny. It's really fun to work on, and so people like to use it for that reason. I like to, to uh, correlate Kubernetes and CrossFit a little bit. What do CrossFit and Kubernetes have in common? First rule of CrossFit, you always talk about CrossFit. First rule of Kubernetes, you always talk about Kubernetes, right? That's why so many of you are here, right? We love to talk about Kubernetes. There's way too many of you here for a meetup. <laughs> uh, uh, of course, like CrossFit, it's like making a new muscle hurt every day. Isn't that fun? And Kubernetes is addicting. CrossFit is too, apparently. Uh, Kubernetes reduces infrastructure costs, but can increase maintenance and operational costs, and most of all, the hidden one, security costs. So I want to talk about that. Kubernetes changed my life. Now I'm, uh, and I went from being a uh, full-on like you kind of. Imagine like I'm this like evangelical warrior for Kubernetes and now I'm like, I'm like this guy, right? All right, let me tell you about the woes of Kubernetes. So Kubernetes used to be like Kubernetes the hard way. You guys all remember Kubernetes the hard way? From uh, um, Hightower. Hightower, right? Great, great topic. Uh, probably those of you who have been introduced to Kubernetes within the last couple of years probably don't know about this because there's lots of tools available now to, to allow you to stay out of Kubernetes. We've got EKS, we've got AKS. We've got GKE, so those are big clouds. If you don't know, that's Azure's container service, Amazon's container service, and Google's container engine. Um, but it used to be, we didn't have those. We had to build Kubernetes. We had to install Kubernetes on IaaS. We had to spin up virtual machines and install this Kubernetes ecosystem. And the best way to do that was to go through Hightower's tutorial on basically Kubernetes the hard way was how to install Kubernetes. If you really want to understand Kubernetes, and that still works today, you definitely want to go through that. But you don't really do that anymore. We, very few of us are doing that anymore because we've got so many tools, so many tools available for us to use to install Kubernetes, which is great. But that presents the next problem. That meant that uh, application teams could run their own Kubernetes clusters. We could just spin them up as a service. We could. Just, we did this at Starbucks. We said, "Hey, you want a cluster? You want a cluster? You want a cluster?" It's kind of like handing out pickup trucks. You get a cluster, and you get a cluster, and you get a cluster. And so we did this, right? But uh, is this really what we want application teams to be doing? Because after you install Kubernetes, you've got to worry about logging and security and ID management, GitOps deployments, pipelines, Helm charts, manifests, cert certificates, upgrades, managing resources and workloads, and so on and so forth. The list can be very long. But I don't like putting a ton of text in my slides. So imagine you could have one superpower, what it would be? Flight, invisibility, super strength, anything? said, no, running databases on Kubernetes reliably. Well, that's not very realistic. I know. But that's a dream. 12% of application teams want to learn Kubernetes. Like most made up stats, this one is false. It's probably zero. Actually, Kubernetes is really fun. A lot of people are like, oh, I want to try that. And they kind of get hyper-focused on this. We, have, we actually had some teams at Starbucks that said, oh, we really, really like Kubernetes. And they went hyper-focused on Kubernetes. And the application was kind of left in the dust. We're like, actually, 
our goal is to build the application. Kubernetes is just a delivery mechanism. It's like ketchup. You know, the whole reason that we eat French fries is it's a delivery mechanism for ketchup, right? <laughs> so Kubernetes is kind of that way too. Kubernetes is designed to be the delivery mechanism for your application to your customers, right? So um, <coughs> application teams, this of course is the learning curve of some container orchestration engines. So we have Mesos and Rancher and Docker Swarm down here, kind of typical learning curves. And then this is Kubernetes. <laughs> can, did, can any of you relate to that a little bit? Oh, come on. <laughs> so Kubernetes, Kubernetes is great, but it's a little bit like trying to kill a mosquito with a tank. A lot of the problems that we have are just we need to kill some mosquitoes. Let's use a tank to do it. Why not? Kubernetes is a tank. We all have like access to this tank we want to use. It's way overkill for like 80, 90% of the problems we're trying to solve. So not all problems should be solved with Kubernetes. Kubernetes overhead and costs, like I've talked about, there are other solutions. There's app services now, right? The cloud has a lot of these app services available. You have functions as a service, which can run in Kubernetes, or not, you know? You have container services, application platforms. We don't wanna be killing mosquito with the tank. So really evaluate the tools and technology. What kind of problem are you trying to solve? Because more than likely, we're trying to oversolve the problem of Kubernetes. So, you be cautious just because it's this cool new thing and this great engine and this really fun technology doesn't mean we should be using it. So, what if we migrated everyone to a shared or managed Kubernetes? Centralized or managed Kubernetes, right? Well, we have a big problem with existing people that are on Kubernetes. One is that what gives people feelings of power? You have money, status, and then Kubernetes. <laughs> this, of course, is the line between those who want to build and manage their own clusters and those who want to use a managed cluster. So this is the kind of the challenge that we face as like leaders within our, uh, of our IT departments within our companies is that all our application teams want to run their own clusters. And why is that? Because you have the full control and the full power over it. A lot of teams are like, I want that. It's kind of like saying, uh, remember, remember back in the days for a lot of you, uh, before we had the cloud and, and the, I, the whole idea of you could provision a virtual machine and get it in the same day was a miracle, right? Remember that? We used to have to make requests and maybe a few days later they'd get around to provisioning you your virtual machine. And then we got the cloud and we could provision the virtual machine in the same day and then it was within the same hour and now it's like three minutes, right? And uh, so people are treating Kubernetes this way. Now you can actually get a Kubernetes cluster within 20 minutes or less. That's really incredible. And so people are like, let's spin up this Kubernetes cluster to run this application. And uh, so then you have, uh, does it really save on your infrastructure costs when you're doing that? No, it doesn't. You know what does save on your infrastructure costs, however, is a shared Kubernetes cluster. And we're talking about this now. It's like, what if you have a single shared Kubernetes cluster for your, all your application teams to deploy their workloads into. That, that actually is a good solution because it means that your application teams are not responsible for that Kubernetes cluster and you have a dedicated operations team that is responsible for that Kubernetes cluster. That's a good one to go. But we have this problem now, we've got these application teams that don't want to release that control. So there are several ways to make Kubernetes easier to use. Uh, you could just don't use it, you know, right away screen, scream and run for your lives, that's the first solution. Like, go for that first. If someone says, no, 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 we can't do that. Okay, so let's let's talk about the other options. You could train all your people to figure it out. That's a big cost, right? Training costs. We have application teams with Kubernetes experts on the application engineers team. Why? Why is that necessary? Why are we doing that? So we're hiring more people. We need to hire more people to figure this out. We have to hire more people to be on this team. We have to train more people to learn Kubernetes and operate our application. Now I have 100 teams with lots of Kubernetes experts spread across all these teams. Hire another company to do it for you. You could hire me. No, I'm just kidding. Don't, don't do that. Uh, wait longer for results. Do more with less. Eventually settle on something that isn't horrible. Find a solution that deploys your applications to environments for you and get on with your actual business, which is delivering your application to your customer, right? For many of us, especially for, and we're, I'm an end user, I'm not a vendor, 
So what matters to Starbucks is selling coffee, right? We want to get the coffee in the customer's hands as quickly as possible, and the technology is just an avenue for that to happen, right? I don't want to be caught up managing infrastructure when I really want to be enabling the business to deliver technology that enables them to sell coffee better and faster, right? So we want our application teams to be focused on that objective. How many of you use the Starbucks app on your phone? Right, that's called MOP at Starbucks, is Mobile Order and Pay. It's a great app, right? We want the application developers who are responsible for that app to be their full focus on building that application, building features and functionality in that application. I don't want them to be worried about managing this infrastructure that supports the application, right? Which is Kubernetes. So let's talk about our ideal app development. This is really cool. This is something that we've been recently exploring and have started to implement at Starbucks. Um, can't see this picture really well, but there's two circles. There's an inner circle and an outer circle. The whole concept, the whole idea is that basically, <laughs> I hope that doesn't force the stall. <laughs> the whole idea is basically, uh, you have your Kubernetes cluster, they can be your development Kubernetes clusters and your non-prod clusters and your production clusters. In the development clusters, that's where your development code can go. And you have tools like Scaffold, which is a fantastic tool. If you haven't used it, I highly recommend it. It allows you to develop code locally, and it immediately builds and pushes to a development cluster, and you can see that code work live as an application, right? There's also this cloud code now that's pretty new. This allows you to install Visual Studio Code in a containerized environment, and your, uh, so now, your application engineers can work entirely within the browser. The Visual Studio Code works in the browser, inside of a container, inside the development uh, Kubernetes cluster, and so nothing is actually local on their machine. It saves a lot of this infrastructure, or a lot of this environment setup for engineers' machines. And by the way, if any of you do labs, like lab works where you have you you do a training and you're you're teaching people uh, uh, to develop something, and you have 20 people and two of them are actually engineers and the other 18 aren't, um, definitely go with this kind of solution because it saves you a ton of time and headache in setting up their environment. So ultimately, what am I getting? We need to, as Kubernetes sort of experts within our fields, our goal is to make Kubernetes more, I don't want to say transparent, it's not going away. It's supporting all the applications that we run and a lot of the future applications that we want to run and container solutions and so forth, but I want to make it at the same level the operating system for our application engineers. So when they talk about delivering their code, the, the, con the, the idea of them troubleshooting in Kubernetes shouldn't be a topic of discussion, right? When you're working with uh, Linux systems, your servers and things like that, are you concerned with your operating system? How many of you are thinking about the operating system constantly and trying to manage the operating system and the CPU and the memory? You're not. It just is there. It's just it's doing its job. It's doing a lot of stuff, but you're not worried about it. You're not really managing it other than the file system. Right? And so that's what we want Kubernetes to be. At the same level of the operating system, abstracted away from the application engineer so that they can just focus on what they need to do. So let's build the tools for those application engineers to do the things that the business needs them to do. All right. I loved this and I just had to share it with y'all. So this is, uh, you ever see those like, hey, we're hiring for this like Java, Python, PHP application engineer and they need to know React and Postgres and MySQL and they need to have experience with AWS and Azure and they need to be a Linux system administrator and they need to know Git and CI with test driven development and they need to have Docker and Kubernetes experience. You guys, this is not a full stack engineer. This is an entire <laughs> IT department, <laughs> right? Now hiring an entire IT department as a single person. You're not, that's, not everyone is on it, you guys. So. Let's focus on having application engineers have the skills of being an application developer, which is like three line items here. Everything else needs to be your DevOps and your SRE engineers who are supporting the business, right? And those SRE engineers don't need to have these other skills. We separate it out a little bit. You're going to have better experience finding the people to run your business. Okay. 
We just, I just had to ask. <laughs> <laughs> I had to ask ChatGPT what it thought about this. I'm like, well, I need some, some feedback on my talk. So I said, what does ChatGPT think about this? So I will read it to you because you probably can't see it in the back. So I said, list 10 reasons why application teams should not run Kubernetes. Number one, lack of expertise. If application teams may not have the necessary expertise to effectively run and maintain a Kubernetes cluster. This thing is incredibly smart, by the way. <laughs> time consuming. Managing a cluster can be time consuming. Complexity. It can be complex to set up and run, requiring a significant amount of technical knowledge. It's resource intensive. Running a cluster can be resource intensive, requiring amount of resources. High availability, achieving high availability can be challenging for those application teams, right? This is not their expertise. They are application engineers. Securing a cluster is very difficult, right? This is the most underestimated thing about containers and Kubernetes. We kind of think about security last. We kind of make the assumption this is secure. It is not secure out of the box, right, at all. There are a lot of security considerations that have to go into a Kubernetes cluster. This talk isn't about that, so I'm not diving into that. But I will say, you definitely need to think about it more than you're thinking about it now. And if you're thinking, I already think about it a lot, yes, even more than that, right? Think about it a lot. Scalability, scaling a cluster can be complex and challenging. It's cost. Running a cu cluster is not cheaper than running virtual machines. It's only cheaper when we make it so that it has these hybrid sort of capabilities, when you allow it to be multi-tenant and allow it to support multiple applications in one. But if you're spinning up a whole cluster to run a single application, that's freaking overkill and more expensive, right? So it's not cheaper. So if you want it to be cheaper, we have to think about how to make it that way. And if you're saving money on the infrastructure costs and you're spending more money on the operation costs, you're not really saving any money. So really think about those things when you're trying to sell it to the business. Integrating clusters with existing systems is not trivial, right? It, there's a lot that goes into that. That's really, I mean, getting a Kubernetes cluster itself is actually really simple. I can spin one up here, there, and everywhere. But integrating all these other components that are part of our business, that's what takes the time. And of course, focus. Applica this is my favorite one, it should be number one. Application teams should focus on developing and deploying their applications, leaving the management of the underlying infrastructure to specialized teams. <clears throat> I tell you what, you guys, ChatGPT, by the way, this is not a ChatGPT talk, but I could give one. ChatGPT will change our future, starting in 2023. Everything is going to change because of GPT. Um, do not underestimate this tool. All right, I'm going to touch on this for a second. So 2015, July 2015, Kubernetes 1.0 was released. In 2017, Starbucks, we started adopting Kubernetes and, and developing it right away. We built multiple Kubernetes services as a platform, <coughs> solutions for teams to spin up those Kubernetes clusters at, at, at will, right? Now we have a problem because now when I look into our Azure infrastructure right now and I look at AKS, we have 143 <coughs> Kubernetes clusters in Azure. So we have, and, and, and ironically, it's actually limited adoption. There's not a whole lot of people that actually want their entire Kubernetes cluster. So we have to think about some different solutions. So right now, we're in the process of rethinking our entire containerization strategy at Starbucks and rethinking about how we operate containers, right? And we're building a central team at Starbucks to build a shared managed Kubernetes solution to solve these problems. That's it. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs>
so that you can manage multiple namespaces in a project, and there can be multiple projects in a cluster, and that kind of isolates your cluster. Now you still, when you when you divide up a cluster like that and you make it multi-tenant, you do want to think about making sure that your neighbors can play nicely with your other neighbors. You don't want to put vastly different businesses on one cluster until you're really experienced with that kind of multi-tenant solution. One more question. So <laughs> you talk a lot about security is very important, uh, but by moving from dedicated <coughs> cluster to a shared cluster, it's actually I think it's bringing a lot of challenges on the security side. Can you share some of how you address this kind of security, right. new security issue? Yeah, so I mean, it's it's all part of the one business, right? So we make sure that they can play nicely with one another. So if we have a one business that requires PII data, we're not gonna put them on businesses that have a different tier of, of data, right? So we wanna make sure that there's a cluster that's dedicated for the PII data so that we can properly secure it. It has different security requirements than these other clusters that don't have PII data. So those, that's an example of, of the considerations. You know, we work very closely with our, our security team to make sure that we have all the considerations in place. But you also have, I mean, it's, there's a certain amount of trust too. And you're monitoring, you know, have an operations team that's monitoring the cluster and watching for your noisy neighbors. Um, pretty much the, the, the big like stepping on toes kind of thing is gonna come in like network areas, ingress and so forth. So having a good ingress controller uh, set up in place is, is a good one to have and just work very closely with your security team. Awesome. Well, thank Great. you so much, Jenna. Awesome. And really funny. Um, and each of you have experiences and knowledge that's valuable to the greater community here. We're always looking for more speakers. So if you're doing something really interesting or you have done something interesting or you just have some funny things to say, we'd love to have you up. We're going to be doing this every single month.